Welcome to the, the Low Carb, Carb Athlete, Athlete Podcast, Podcast, where we focus on discussing topics to help you burn fat, optimize health, and improve performance in life and sports. Transform the whole you from the inside out with the holistic method. Let's dive in. Here's your host, Debbie Potts. Hey guys, just wanted to give you a quick little message of one of my favorite new product lines out there. Ideal for the low carb athlete to fuel before, during, and after your workouts. This company is called Equip Foods. Equip is one of my favorite supplement brands as they provide some of the shortest ingredients lists in the industry, which is hard to find, with products made from 100% real food, no junk, no chemicals, no artificial flavors or fillers. Their best seller is what I've been using, the Chocolate Prime Protein, which is actually a grass-fed beef protein powder providing a whopping 21 grams of complete protein in each scoop with only three ingredients, and you don't even taste them. Grass-fed beef protein, stevia, and cocoa. Now, don't worry, despite its simplicity, it does taste incredible, not like beef. That would not taste good in my shake. Equip also has a one-ingredient collagen powder made from grass-fed bovine collagen, providing incredible benefits for your joint health, skin, and recovery, plus more ideal for the aging athlete. Equip is currently having its biggest sale of the year to date, so if you're interested in checking out Prime Protein, Collagen, or any of their other products, as I like the pre-workout wad before my strength training sessions, get up to 25% off. Head to equipfoods.com slash low carb athlete. So you can use your code low carb athlete and get a deal. Enjoy. Hey guys, it's Debbie, and I am having my friend Angela Foster come back on the show today just to have a great conversation about what we are both up to in our mission to improve our future self. So, how are we showing up to life? today. That's important. But as you age up, for me, turning 50, now living my second half of my life, I'm on a mission to train to be my best self now, but also my future self. So how do I want to be living my life every day when I'm 80? That's what I'm training for. I'm not training for any specific races right now. I'm focusing on getting stronger, getting powerful, getting leaner, and getting faster on the bike, getting those my FTP up, and I'm trying to do more speed power work running so I can get my muscles to activate correctly when I run so my speed is back where I, it used to be once upon a time. So I wanted to bring on Angela just to talk about... Uh, kind of biohacking a little bit in her world and what she's up to because she is a host of her own podcast called High Performance Health. She's based in the UK, London. She's a nutritionist, health performance coach, creator of a new program she created, created obviously, she's a creator of BioSync and her podcast is one of the top 10 alternative health podcasts. So you can check out High Performance Health to learn more, she focuses on the, the female to be their best self and live their best lives. And she's Angela's background, kind of different but similar, but we both ex- experienced adrenal fatigue, adrenal exhaustion, burnout, and breakdown. But hers is from the corporate world versus mine's the fitness world and athletic world. But she was a former partner in a large law firm. And so she's kind of what happens when you work in law, I find, hear about the, the demands of working long hours and difficulty for women facing these high performance requirements as having a family and just trying to find ways to optimize their health and longevity. So I think a lot of her why, her purpose, is I'll talk about my why a lot on my show, is Angela suffered burnout and major depression and just accumulation of fatigue led to a life-threatening battle of pneumonia and Angela used biohacking, holistic health and spiritual practices to rebuild her mental and physical health. 
So with her regular podcast and having guests on her show, and she speaks to large corporations, she continues to learn a lot. We both met in the Ben Greenfield Keon program, and that was, I don't know how many years ago. And then Keon Coaches, we started Ben Greenfield Coaching two and a half years ago. So those of us that became Keon Coaches were able to apply to be a Ben Greenfield coach because Ben's not coaching as much. And so both of us are contracted out coach once in a while for our nutrition clients through the Ben Greenfield coaching program. So Angela and I have known each other for a while and it's never really see her because she's in London and I'm in San Diego, but someday we'll connect in person. And I think it's really interesting. Go back to listen to our past podcast on, uh, Angela and I did on her show, and then we did one on my show, different topics. So we're going to talk a little bit about what she's up to, but I did want to add some things we didn't get to. So I think what I'm trying to do on this show is to share my journey, my experiences, lessons learned, things I'm studying and diving deep into as I investigate clients' areas of opportunity because we identify some imbalances with functional lab testing and then I assess their nutritional therapy world and then look at their exercise world and their lifestyle habits. So the holistic method is the eight elements that I coach people on, but put that in with the health investigation program to make them be fit and healthy from the inside out. So one thing I have learned over the years is that we need to vary everything. You'll hear about keto flexibility, Carb metabolism is still necessary, so we don't want to be in strict nutritional ketosis all the time. We need to flex in and out of it, and we'll have one day, or for heavier athletes that are not heavier weight, but exercising a lot heavier, higher intensity, that we might need a carb refeed every evening. Some people that don't exercise much, then maybe they're good once a week. And then we know females that are cycling need to do more carb metabolism, more carb intake, get out of ketosis, in their late luteal phase because progesterone needs to build and we need to be out of ketosis to get progesterone up. And then the first half of female cycle, we want to improve estrogen and estrogen likes insulin low. So being in ketosis helps around there. So the female cycling, mapping it out is pretty cool. And I do that for my clients and put it on training peaks and match what their workouts are. So you, there is an example of variations that we want to vary our workouts. We want to vary our nutrition. Maybe you're doing carnivore reset, which is a good protocol for people that have inflammation and have a lot of issues with oxalate, lectins, phytates, FODMAPs. You know, there's a lot to it, but there's a purpose to it. So doing, say, a menopausal a menu pause recipe plan that Dr. Anna Kabeca has in her book, Menu Pause, you can figure out when should you push pause and say a carnivore reset and then do a keto green program or go into nutritional keto type of program and then you know reset so looking at females can help figure out which week of their month they should be in what nutrition program and then men can choose kind of how you feel i'm matching it with maybe the type of workouts you're doing. If you're doing a off season, then doing more speed workout before a race. And so your nutrition should be changing. So we want to time our nutrients in and around our workouts. If we need to eat something before a workout, if it's later in the morning versus first thing in the morning, I don't like to eat, but having, when is it necessary to have some calories in my coffee or tea if you're not a coffee drinker or do mud water that, you know, we want to look at what our fueling, training, and performance plan looks like. So variation of everything is key. That also goes with strength training. You know, are you doing the same strength workout over and over again? Are you even doing strength workout? Are you doing just chronic cardio? Are you doing too much HIIT training? Or are you even doing HIIT training pr- properly? A lot of people don't go hard to make it effective. So HIIT training, HIIT training or short intensity interval training that are that 20, 30 seconds all out, it's hard to do and you have to be in the right frame of mind, right energy level to go hard and go all out. So it doesn't always happen. So you want to really look at 
uh, what you feel like and tracking your heart rate variability score will help as well. And looking at your deep sleep. Did you have good rest and recovery to go hard? Are you doing a hard workout then easy, easy? So when we're writing, when I'm writing workout schedules for my clients, I'm looking at, okay, are we doing maybe two HIIT training workouts per week and then doing zone two workouts, maybe one long one on the weekend? Are you doing strength training? Are you doing yoga? Are you doing core work? So we wanna mix it up because we need all of it, but not too much, right? So more is not better, sometimes less is more. So what is the minimal effective dose to create that positive effect? If we start doing HIIT training every day, it's not really effective. You're overtraining under recovery. If you're doing excessive chronic cardio over 45 minutes every day, it's not really beneficial as well because you're raising that cortisol after 45 minutes. And if you already have adrenal issues and have high cortisol, you're just making it worse. And so we really want to, as I say, test and not guess and look at what's going on functionally in hidden internal sources of chronic stress. So looking at the Dutch test for your hormones, and that's the dried urine test. Looking at your stool test with this GI map or Genova diagnostics stool test. Looking at your food sensitivities, your reactions to wheat. I haven't had one person do the wheat zoomer from Vibrant Wellness that had no reaction to wheat in the parts of wheat, the gluten. So if you're still doing wheat sometimes, you might wanna get a wheat zoomer as I did a couple years ago and realize how it's impacting your health. And it doesn't mean you have constipation, diarrhea, uh, bloating, gas, you know, stuff issues with your gut. It could be skin issues, it could be migraines, it could be just chronic joint pain. All these different random symptoms could be related to what you're eating, how you're eating, when you're eating, why you're eating, and working on improving our gut health microbiome. So point of this intro to the podcast and what we're working on is variation. So vary everything. So also working on sleep stacks, you know, really optimizing sleep so I can optimize my recovery and repair, detoxification, gut health, timing or fasting. Fasting isn't really necessary for athletes when you're already doing some workouts and help that cell autophagy and you're having some coffee in the morning. Perhaps a fasted morning workout that you're not eating four to six hours before, or for me, you know, dinner might be at three, four o'clock afternoon. Make sure you're just fasting 12 hours to 15 hours max. We don't need to go more than that because then we end up low energy availability and not hitting our protein goals to help our protein synthesis and recovery repair. So I've really changed. It's a constant effort to figure out how to get enough calories in, how to hit my protein goals, how to get some key and essential amino acids in pre and post workout. If I don't feel like eating, that's a great way to sneak in some protein. So you're getting protein broken down already. So you don't have to digest it because it's essential amino acids, what protein breaks down to. So that's really important. So looking at placing a longer fast as I've been trying to do Sundays, eat earlier, stop eating after four o'clock and then Monday, more of a rest day that you're just doing light, easy workout, maybe some strength training, but nothing excessive that you're going to maybe go fast until 10 a.m. And so you're doing a more of a 17 hour where cell autophagy begins. If you want to do cell autophagy or gut reset protocol is 24 hours. So if you look at Dr. Mindy's protocols, I've been working on those with clients that have need to do a gut repair. They do need to get cell autophagy they do need help repairing their microbiome. So we will do a 24 hour fast, but make it a bone broth fast. I like bonafide provisions, drink that bone broth in that eight hour window and you have to drink you know, a lot of it and get some minerals in it, pour some Redmond's re salt in it, get some MCT oil or Kerrygold butter or ghee or some coconut oil itself. So add some healthy fats in it so it's satiating that can be more of a bone broth fast, might be better for you as an active, high-performing athlete. So there's different biohacks I work on with with clients, but it's more individual. So working on what your ideal day is, how should you start the day, how should you end your day, where is your supplement timing, your meal timing, your walking throughout the day, are you watching, getting morning sunrise, watching the sunrise, or and getting the sun set in the evening. So we want to work on that. 
but variation of your workouts, your strength training, your type of workout. So if you're doing a, a swim workout, a bike workout, run workout, changing the pace, changing the route, changing the variation, doing low heart rate and then doing high heart rate intervals one day. So mixing it up, we get used to doing the same thing. I used to say I used to do Ironmans every year, 2001 till about, I stopped training in 2015 for the long stuff. I still would do century bike rides and try to keep up the training, but I stopped racing from adrenal exhaustion hitting me in 2013 that then I tried again, racing again, and just train, not race. But I had no changes when I was doing Ironmans. I'd do two a year because I'd be qualifying for Hawaii Ironman and doing Ironman Hawaii in October. And really, I didn't lose any weight. I wish I appreciated my body back then because I always thought I could lose more weight. My legs were too big. I needed to lose some inches and probably never ate enough and was training a ton. So I was probably one of those low energy availability victims and fasting too much and eating too little and not getting the protein I needed back then. But I wasn't losing weight. And then when I hit adrenal fatigue in March 2013, 10 years ago, right now, I gained 30 pounds by that June. I remember going to Ironman Coeur d'Alene to watch my clients race, my husband, and I finally found a scale and snuck in the bedroom of the, or the bathroom at the Airbnb we rented and weighed myself in private. It's like, holy crap, how I knew I was overweight, but just to see those numbers skyrocket from being best shape of my life that previous fall to winter to uh, being heaviest in my life. So that's why we want to look at the holistic method for fueling, training, performing our best in life for now and for events this upcoming year and looking at how you want to be showing up to life your future self. So you want to avoid burnout and breakdown with adrenal fatigue, which continues. You have hyperadrenic activity. If you don't stop and pause and reset and change the way you, lie, you live your life, then suddenly you've got low cortisol output and everything gets sluggish and slow and you're tired and you hit what's called adrenal exhaustion or you're in the HPA axis compensatory phase. So we want to really take care of the whole you, the whole me from the inside out, doing the functional lab testing, doing the lifestyle habits. You can't out exercise poor nutrition habits. You can't out supplement poor lifestyle habits. So even if we do all this testing, that's what I did in the beginning. Saw doctor after doctor after doctor. I think I saw like eight different doctors, functional medicine, traditional medicine, chiropractors trying to get help. And everyone did lab tests and give me supplements or try to give me prescription drugs. And I never took those, but I did the supplements. And I didn't really get the results I needed to get back then as much as I could have because I did not change the way I was showing up to life. I didn't change how much I was training. I kept pushing it even though I was tired and I kept trying to get back to racing. And so I want you to listen to what we talked about today. Take in account of how are you feeling when you wake up in the morning? Are you energetic? Are you energized? Or are you just kind of slogging through the day? Are your workouts crappy? If you look at yourself in the mirror or a window when you run by, are you slumped over? looking rounded over, looking at the ground and just kind of trotting through and jogging instead of running with great efficiency and strength and power. Are you biking just to get those miles in and swimming? Are you trying to get certain meters? Are you getting quality over quantity? So again, there's reason I say less is more and more is not better. Find the Goldilocks effect and find what works best for you today, this week, this month, and vary everything you're doing. Test and not guess with your biometrics as Aura and Whoop, testing your blood sugar, getting these blood chemistry panels and GI tests at least you know, twice a year, get your whole profiles done. Retest every six months. Are you doing the right things? Are you taking all those supplements for a reason? A lot of people, I just, you know, you need to get rid of half of those. There's no point. So we wanna personalize what you're doing, what you're taking, when, why, and how. So I'll stop talking, but let's bring on Angela and listen to her cute British accent. And she is one smart lady. So let's learn more from Angela and we'll talk about what we are both up to. Hey everyone. I've got my friend Angela Foster from the UK coming on the show. We're going to talk shop, kind of just what's new in our world, how we can 
really improve our future self. As I talk about how to fuel, train, and perform your best in life for now, but how about how you're going to be showing up to your life 20, 30 years from now, 10 years from now? It's all about what you do now. So Angela, thanks for coming on to Talk Shop. Hey, Debbie. I love it. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me back on. It's it's nice to chat and connect across the pond. It's kind of late in the evening where where I am here. I I say late. It's kind of 5 p.m. and your day is just getting started. It is. We're at (laughs) 9.15 a.m. So (laughs) I know your podcast, you're all about high performance and we're endurance athletes, high performing athletes. So what's kind of new in your world, what you've been learning a lot about the female cycle and biosyncing. But for men and women, because my I was telling you, my male athletes want some attention too. <laughs> so what's yeah, new in your world, how to really improve optimization and what's what's some hot topics that you've been diving into? What have I been diving into? I guess this year I've been kind of diving in, in my community, a lot into metabolism, uh, picking up actually what you said there about future self. That's an area that I just love, kind of positive psychology and really designing your life. I think it's really interesting, isn't it? Because I actually at the moment have uh, a couple of teenage boys in the house, uh, my boys, and then I have my daughter who's 10. And I think when you're growing up, you really think about who you want to be in a, mm-hmm. in, you can't, because you think anything's possible, right? And then in your twenties, you sort of feel like you're invincible and I think when you hit your 30s you're kind of like uh maybe I need to like <laughs> slow down a little bit or certainly that's how I was um and then I think we it, it's easy to forget as you get older that you can still continue to design your life and mm-hmm. um Dr. Ben Hardy but Dr. Benjamin Hardy's work. Yeah, I get his emails. Your future self. Yeah, me too. Love it. And I think, and his books, I think are incredible. Mm-hmm. I feel really fortunate. Actually, I got an advanced copy of his latest book, 10X is Easier Than 2X, that's coming out. And mm. really fascinating stuff. And having read Your Future Self and just a lot of other authors that talk about a similar thing, I've been diving into the psychology and the science of that. And one of the things he says is, you know, your future self will be a lot different than you think you're going to be. And I think that people lose sight of that. And I think if you look back, one of the easiest ways to kind of approach this is to look back and think about who you were 10 years ago. And probably Mm -hmm. you're quite different, right? You've come a long way. Your friendships may have changed. You've learned a lot. You've done different things in business. You know, maybe you've become an ultra endurance athlete and you weren't, you weren't doing anything like that before. Or, you know, and I think it's so interesting when you look at this, because I think we can kind of get into our 40s and forget that we still have that ability to control to a degree, right, to design our life, to design our destiny. Um, So, yeah, what about you? That's this this kind of interesting area for me. Well, you know, I'll, I'll tell people I got that future self thing from Benjamin Hardy. And so you can do, listeners, you can do a free online 30-day course. If you go to, is it Benjamin Hardy? I'll find that link and put it in the show notes. But it's free. And it's every day you have an assignment that takes five minutes to write. And it's, a friend told me about it. And I try to tell other people about it. But that is where I got to thinking about how do I want to be showing up in 10 years from now? And then you... And I both lost our dads last year. And it's more watching my mom and watching her friends. They're all 80. How do I want to be living my life? And my husband's father is turning 90 this year. And I look at him traveling Europe and doing things. But when we retire, I don't want to be stuck not being able to move and you know have all these health problems that I listen to everyone have. So to me... Benjamin Hardy, great lesson to start thinking about how do you want to be showing up to life when you are retired? So when you're 70, 80, 90 years old. And so that kind of started me down that path of let's train for events and races now, but I should be more concerned about how I'm going to be aging and improving that aging process so I can travel the world when I'm 89 years old, not be stuck mm. at home in a <laughs> assisted living home. So yeah, for sure. I same here, same here. And I think the concept of like making decisions from your future self as well, right? Yeah. Uh, and stepping into that most empowered version of you. Really interesting. Something that I do mm-hmm. uh, in my own programs with my clients. Um, but I also think with longevity, you know, longevity just means you want to live longer, but by how much? Six hours? Six days, yeah. six weeks, like six years. Like, what does that mean in reality? Yeah. Because it's health span, I think, that we're looking at. And mm-hmm. I think, you know, looking at the different markers of aging, 
is really important along the way. So that's something I'm doing. I'm doing a, like a, a longevity project on myself this year. So it's all going to be coming out on my podcast quite soon. But at the moment, what I'm doing is just testing, 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 testing. I know you're a big fan of testing, not guessing. Yeah. Uh, and I've been doing that. So I've done some hair mineral testing. I've done uh, a glycan age, biological age test. <laughs> I've just uh, ordered a microbiome test. I've done some blood work. I've done some hormones with the Dutch test and putting all this information together. I've also done some VO2 max testing, um, some kind of mobility and functional strength testing. And I'm designing a kind of 12 month program around how can I get, because I'm 47 and I think, how can I get into kind of the fittest shape that I can be? ahead of when when I eventually <laughs> this doesn't apply to the men listening this thing but for those women listening like how can I get into the best physical shape possible possible before I start to hit those sort of really hormonal changes I know they're bubbling away underneath but I'm not quite there yet <laughs> well that's what when I turned 50 I'm now 51 but um you're almost yeah over a year ago I turned 50 and that's what my goal was men and women, this applies to everyone. Once you turn 50, this is like the second half of your life. And how can I live my best life, my second half of my life? So mm-hmm. as I was reaching 50, I had this big uh, workout to do on my 50th birthday. It was strength and some plyometrics and doing hill repeats and a run. So I did, I had all this plan. And so it was more, it just got me thinking of, okay, like looking at your future self, but what, how can I perform my best as I get older and not live life thinking, oh, age, I'm getting older, I'm getting slower, I'm getting fatter, I'm losing <laughs> muscle. So it's really embracing the aging process that I talk about on the show all the time, but just testing and not guessing as you're doing, you're looking at all these labs and assessments of your age. So what type of I don't know, looking at your age and biological age, is it scary to see that? I don't know. Somehow I've been kind of afraid to know what's actually there. Am I (laughs) one or am I 61? Or am I 37? I I felt quite lucky, right? So I I did mine and I bought a two pack because glycan age is a test that basically looks at it from a kind of inflammatory point of view. And it's looking at how your immune system. So it's this concept of inflammation, looking at glycans in the body. And uh, how how quickly are you aging? And um, I bought a two pack because I was thinking this will be good because then I can basically institute the changes and see what's happening. Uh, and then um, I got my my test through and it, it said I was age 20, which is like the youngest. So I was like, oh, OK, <laughs> that was actually a pretty good result. Not all my results have been that good, should I say. Uh, but that one certainly was pretty nice. Yeah. So you do look a lot younger than your age. So you you look like you're maybe 20 something. So I do not. (laughs) I think Debbie's just being very nice and complimentary here. But you are focusing on, I see on Instagram, your social media, you're doing a lot more heavy lifting. So how have you changed your way you're fueling, training, performing as you age up as a high charging, high performing individual. Yeah. So for me, it's interesting, isn't it? When I look at the, like the lifting and stuff. So I am, um, I have been doing like putting on a lot more muscle, uh, in preparation. Cause I think obviously muscle is an organ of longevity. Yeah. Um, so that's something I've been working on, but I also, we, you were talking there about how we both lost our dads in the last sort of 12 months. And for me, having had mental health problems in the past, that was a big deal. And I think that I had to kind of like working out in the morning, there's something methodical about lifting weights for me that helps create order in my brain. That's why I love it. But what I have noticed over time is as you lift heavier and heavier and you're doing kind of less reps is the strain on your nervous system is quite high. Mm -hmm. So I'm at the moment trying to balance that because I think that you always crave more of what you do, right? So Mm -hmm. the more I lift, the more I crave to lift. And then I kind of put the cardio bit on the back burner. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to kind of regain my focus there because I think otherwise you can only like you can't just keep lifting heavier and heavier right at some point you've got to find a different stimulus um, I think and just mix things up and periodize that training so that's what I've been doing but I do enjoy uh, just working out first thing in the morning I find it really sets the tone for my day I don't know about you yeah I was just recording a podcast yesterday I'm trying to do these solo podcasts when it things I'm thinking about working on. And it was about your ideal day and how to start your day and and how it ends up being, you know, how to optimize your sleep (laughs) to have the best day ever because that impacts everything and how to manage your stress. But just that morning sunshine exposure. And I found some different articles and what Ben Greenfield talked about with us in our, our Keon coaching on, you know, he writes 
in the past about the ideal day and how to start your day and that morning sunrise and sunshine. And I like to get up and work out. I know the best time of day when your body's better for more of a high intensity training is say three o'clock in the afternoon, four o'clock, but I'm usually working. So for me, it's just get up and go is my type of workout. (laughs) And then I like to move throughout the day. You know, this new job working at a computer, (laughs) standing here looking at the screen Mm -hmm. is a little different for me from a background of running my own fitness business and training clients and being in a, a gym, training clients to now standing at a computer is different. So I like to, you know, I always th- thought of this during COVID breakfast, lunch, dinner means move times, not eat. So it's a good cue to go, okay, it's noon. It doesn't mean I need key. to eat lunch. It means get up, get off my butt, <laughs> get outside, do some movement training. And there's all that research. I love the Huberman lab series with Dr. Andy Gaplin, and I'm still listening to those six series and they're about three hour long podcasts. So they take forever to listen to, but just how doing those 20 second burst training throughout the day, just get movement and energize or running up your set of stairs or wherever you live, you can go outside. But I like to get up and work out and get moving because they're outside. I'm tired. I'm sluggish or I just don't get my mind right. So yes, I agree. Waking up in the morning, I lift weights and then go for a run or I take spin class once a week to work on some power and then I just need to get outside. And I'm fortunate where I moved to is, uh, as just this morning, running Torrey Pines to Del Mar and looking at the ocean. I saw some dolphins. Oh, beautiful. And it's just when the sun's coming up at wow. 6.15 in the morning and we get to the gym at 5.30. So, you know, my ideal day is getting up early and working out and getting lift and then go outside and get some fresh air. And then I, a few days a week, I do master swimming, which is an outdoor pool at lunchtime. And so that's my another second workout of the day that I do three, four days a week. So it just, I need that outdoor time, time in nature, Mm. fresh air, ocean, beach when I can. Yeah. Nature. Yeah. That's beautiful. I love, um, I don't live near the sea, but I Mm -hmm. live near forest. So going out walking with my dogs is, you know, Mm -hmm. one of my favorite things you can kind of, I just lose myself in nature or listen to a podcast, but the second workout of the day usually eludes me. It's something that I have in my head. And I I remember listening to Robin Sharma saying, you know, the second workout and the sort of magic of it. But I think with have three kids and school runs yeah. and sports clubs and athletics. <laughs> I don't have kids <laughs> or pets. So. <laughs> yeah. But that's my mantra. The new me since like my adrenal exhaustion happened, which is my 10 year anniversary now on it. And it is more looking at less is more, more is not better. So, you know, yes, should I move and get movement or exercise in throughout the day rather than doing it all at once in the morning? Or, you know, is it ideal for me to just get up, do my workout? And that, you know, not do a, a lunchtime workout. It depends on the day. Even last night, I recorded this in my podcast. My ideal day was, you know, how to wind down in my evening routine. But if it's more is not better, if you're trying to do all these different things in the day, like if you have kids and you have a dog and you have to do this and then dishes and laundry, and then it's like, ah, now I'm stressed mm. out. So does it defeat the purpose to do my evening routine if I'm trying to fit so much stuff in in a day? Am I just, I need to know when to take something away so it's not so cramped and, and trying to fit all these great health benefits into our day. And then we're just adding more stress. They become a stress rather than a benefit. Yeah. It's so true. It's so true. Is this it's the perpetual thing, isn't it? Of getting the yeah. balance right. <laughs> yeah, it is. And that's why I was trying to, you know, trying to figure out a format to write out for my clients that I coach full time. And that's like, what is your ideal day? Let's like write it out example of what works best. And then do you have enough breaks? Because what I did in the, my previous life was living life as a race. I was doing too much from like trying to fit more time in the day, getting up earlier and earlier and still being going say four in the morning till nine at night. And that's what I think a lot of people do when you're trying to be healthy and you're trying these different lifestyle strategies to improve your sleep and recovery and pair. And then I'm exercising. And then, you know, most people like you have kids and family and have to cook meals. And it's like, all right, am I doing too much of everything to really be healthy? (laughs) Just causing me adrenal dysfunction by trying to be this invincible person. As we talked about the beginning of the show, are you trying to be invincible? Think you're a superhero that you can pile on more and more to be healthy. It's very true. 
I mean, I, I, do you know, Andy Galpin, you're talking about that series on Who yeah. Man, which I loved, and uh, he's actually coming on my show in a few <gasps> weeks' time. So I've been Lucky kind of you. digesting it all to to then pose some questions to him. And and one of the things I really like that he talks about, in addition to his kind of four quadrants where you score yourself, is um, this concept of a wandering baseline that you want to avoid. And I think mm. what you're describing there is the wandering baseline, right? Where mm. you try to achieve everything. So now you are a little bit underslept, a little bit mm-hmm. overstressed, a little bit less productive, a little bit overstretched in terms of work. Maybe you're overeating or undereating a little bit too much. Then you kick off at your kids, right? And the, he, he has this quadrant that he utilizes where you have to score a total of 10, which you'll have heard when you listen to them, right? And it's like, where are you in terms of your business? Or you could replace that with wealth, for example, in that category, if you think of a circle, and then you have relationships, you have fitness and you have recovery. And the, the recovery should be at least half of the fitness. But that's not by definition with a score of 10 is not intended to be equal. And so when you start to score into those categories, what you realize is that to avoid that wandering baseline, you're always going to put something more into a bucket because I don't think Mm. it's intended to be two and a half, two and a half, two and a half, two and a half, right? So then a lot of people will say, Mm -hmm. particularly in their forties, they're kind of really progressing. They've got really good strides in their career. They may put, I find with clients, they'll put a five into that business or wealth bucket. Mm -hmm. um, And then they're allocating the others. And then it's like, oh my God, you know, does that feel wrong if I do that? Is that selfish to my family? Is it? But I actually think that when you look back, we were saying, look back at your past to see how different you've become. Uh, you will have noticed that when you were at school, this is exactly how it worked for you. If you were in an exam period, loads and loads of energy was going into one bucket, right? And you would sacrifice your social life for a bit. And then you'd come and pull away from that, wait for the results, and you'd spend time with friends and family and hang out. And I think we try, particularly as a parent, you try and juggle all of them. And that's when you kind of fall into that trap of the wandering baseline. Mm -hmm. So I think actually understanding that you can have everything you want, but maybe not everything at the same time Mm -hmm. and just periodizing your year is is one of the best things you can do to look across the 12 months and not just periodize your training program but periodize elements of your life you know so like now I'm going all in I've got a launch going on for example I'm going to really put my efforts into this project and come the summer I'm going to take some time off I'm going to hang out with my family my kids and they're going to get my energy Mm -hmm. and I think that's that's actually almost a better way and then you don't feel like you're constantly juggling a million things well, I think that is a good example of how entrepreneurs, practitioners, and people in our space, I like, I look at Cynthia Thurlow as I talk to her and it's like, how do you keep up with that schedule? Because if I'm trying to help people, I have to practice what I preach. And if I'm pushing the envelope every day and doing so much, am I just going to cause myself adrenal exhaustion and burnout and breakdown again and, and trying to make a difference to follow my purpose and my passion and, you know, reach your mission. I think you do need to, as a leader in whatever community you're in, <laughs> you need to really walk the talk and know how to push pause, reset and reboot your system and know, okay, I need to set boundaries because I'm doing too much and I need to unplug disconnect so I can connect with my own family, with my own self and know when to, you know, take summer off. But I think a lot of people in, in our society are just putting, doing too much and trying to, in our community on biohacking and everyone into longevity and exercise endurance, we're just putting too much in the, in the day. And I think it's important going back to, you know, doing all your testing you're doing and figuring out how can I be my best self now and my best future self? And I think figuring out those tools and, you know, doing like you're talking to Dr. Andy Gaplin about the buckets and, and that's so individualized. That's why I think it's good to work with the coach to figure out, you know, where should my energy go and what's the saying where my energy goes, my something, what is it? Where energy <laughs> goes, focus flows. Yeah. Focus. Well, I just had that in my yeah. little manifestation book. I've been working on at night. <laughs> But anyways, it's just such a big topic because I think it's carving out your day and how to be your best self as an athlete, a spouse, parent, you know, employee, boss, whatever you do. I think it's, there's so much we're trying to fit. And that's kind of what I do. The holistic method is coaching all these elements, but when am I doing piling on too much of this and trying to try too hard? (laughs) Yeah, for sure. And what did Cynthia say? I'm curious. I remember interviewing her a while back. How does she fit in everything that she's doing? Because she has kids as well. Yeah, she's kids. I mean, she's good at at saying no to things. And I know she's not going to, for example, KetoCon is what I was asking her because we 
hung out last year at the conference and had dinner with Paleo Valley. It was super fun. And, but she's traveling and she's different conference. That's the point. Cause they have conferences. These top people, they speak at every weekend you could be gone. And that's when you usually you're with your family. And, and I, I always wonder how people survive, but she, you know, I think you have to learn how to say no when you're a big influencer and carve out time with your family and go to vacation. But, you know, is it good to work nonstop six months and then just have August that you're with your family? Or I don't know, or is it once a month? I have one weekend that I'm making sure I have all my energy focusing on my family and myself. So I don't know what's best, but that's the personalization of it. Yeah. I think that's the personal bet because kids grow so quickly, right? Yeah. That's the thing. I know. It's like, and each year they're different. I think that's the biggest thing is I don't want to miss it. Like, yeah. Yeah. So it's tricky. Yeah. Be with them. Um, so uh, with that, with it, like, how do you get more exercise in with like doing new adventures with your family on a weekend? If you have time to do with your kids and being out in nature, how do you think it's to stay fit and healthy as a high performer with your family? Do you get them involved in doing exercise or going for hikes or new adventures? We do. So my kids do love going hiking. And I think that's something we do. They love to swim. Um, but I think what's difficult, and sometimes we'll just go and we'll have a like last Sunday, we were just mucking around playing football together, right? And we will do that sometimes. Or we'll have that a game means of tennis. soccer in the US. We, the rest of the world in is the US. Yes. Yeah, and <laughs> we went. In- <laughs> we're not playing American football. Yeah. We're playing soccer, just kicking a ball around, having fun. But I think it is, I think it varies again, you know, personalization, which is something I know you really uh, focus on. It varies from family to family because my mm. kids are very sporty. So we don't actually, and, and then my husband and I like to work out or go for a run and things like that. So actually doing it as a family together is much harder. That isn't always the way we spend time together because my daughter is really into gymnastics. She's in the squad she uh is um like really into her netball and her hockey my son's into his rugby his hockey his swimming so they're doing different things and so the reality is that a lot of my conversations and times with my kids are in the car as their taxi driver (laughs) yeah (laughs) and that involves more sitting than I would want but I want to be a part of their lives and watch them play and things like Mm -hmm. that and it would be I feel wrong of me to say, no, we've got to cut back. We can't do those things because we're going to do some stuff as a family. So we try and fit in the family stuff on top. I think holidays, we call them, vacations, you call them, are really important. Mm -hmm. I really genuinely do because I think that's the one time. And I think, you know, what's really interesting is our entire family looks back on this time three years ago, March 2020, with so much love. We Mm -hmm. just loved it. It was Mm -hmm. scary and we felt for the people who were sick. But we literally, everyone had to button down the hatches here in the UK. Mm. It was super, super strict lockdown. And the kids just remember it was beautifully sunny, really warm weather, just hanging out as a family. And we read books together. We watched TV together. We would go out for our one hour a day that we were allowed and take a picnic and go with our dogs. But we just hung together. Do you know what I mean? It was so nice. Wow. They only let you outside for, they had guidelines. We were only allowed out for an hour a day. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. I'd freak out. Well, fortunately, we could spend time in the garden. We actually ended up spending a bit more time outside, but the idea was that you didn't. I mean, people were quite serious at that point, you know. Yeah. They were wearing masks. It was three years ago. Yeah. It was St. Patrick's Day, middle March 2020. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I remember it well because my daughter's birthday party was cancelled at the very last minute because you couldn't host it. Yeah. So, yeah. So, that, uh, two things there. So, I find people, kids working out more at the gym, especially it's kind of cool. Six in the morning, I see these kids all working out. Adults too. I'm seeing this problem. I don't know if it's since the pandemic, but do people, do you find, don't know how to communicate anymore? Because <laughs> they work out with headphones on. Everyone's got those little ear pods on at the gym. And I just remember the days people used to chit chat, shoot the crap, you know, just say, Hey, you know, to banter back and forth. And now everyone is like on their phone, looking at whatever social media or podcasts or whatever they're looking at. And then they have music on or listening to something and no one's communicating anymore. There's, I feel this sadness at the gym and seeing kids of, and adults, people of all ages, not knowing how to communicate anymore. <laughs> so yeah. do you feel that has changed? 
when you go to the gym? Do people I do more? and I think you know what I'm guilty of it myself because when I go in the morning I'm usually trying to prime my brain at the same time as mm. my body so I think what I put between my ears is really important however I do take the time to smile to people yeah. and to say hi and there's regulars in there that I see every pretty much every day they're there and we've kind of got to know each other a little bit but I agree with you I think it is difficult and I think people are really really consumed and I think just having that ability to unplug and detach uh, that's another thing that Dr. Ben Hardy talks about is psychological detachment and mm-hmm. I think for anyone listening to this like we, you know when we have a family meal for example there is nothing allowed no phones yeah. no tv nothing we just talk and I yeah. think it's so important otherwise you lose that in mm-hmm. the car I talk to my kids sometimes I have to take a work call I try not to because I want to hear about their day because to be honest if you don't listen then you've missed it mm-hmm. but I think you're right and I think the importance of group classes I think they've had a bit of a revival since COVID mm-hmm. as well because mm-hmm. I think people are looking for that interaction and that yeah. sense of community that isn't there but then mm-hmm. I guess we have also created amazing online communities right so when I look at my own community my membership it spans across so many different countries and yeah. I think it's really beautiful that there's women in there from so many different places so yeah, yeah. I don't know I guess we have to embrace technology well I think degree. people just need to learn how to say hello it's a yes. five ten rule I heard years ago five feet to 10 feet. If you see someone five feet away from you, say hello, verbal something acknowledgement. If you see someone 10 feet away from you, wave or nod or something acknowledgement that way, nonverbal. That's good. And I think that's a great rule to go by because I'm new here. We've lived here. It was middle 2020. We moved to San Diego and so I didn't know anybody and going to the gym past two years and I'm social, like to meet people. <laughs> so you kind of feel like you're at your, in the gym. Those are your people. Cause they're working out at five 30 in the morning. And it's just something I've really noticed how it's really hard to like get someone to like, do I talk to them? Cause they have ear pods on. Do I say hello? And I don't need a whole conversation. I just mean like, you know, hi, <laughs> good morning. How are you doing? Just small talk. But I just, think it's, I feel bad for the future generations. <laughs> These kids we even working out together have headphones on. So it's like, what's happening to everyone? Even they're working out together, but they're not talking to each other either. So it's just funny to me. So yeah. anyway, it's a side note. <laughs> so. Yeah. It's a shame, I guess, isn't it? I think, I think there's yeah. a balance. Yeah. But okay. then at the same time, I kind of want to get my workout done. I don't always want to chat to people because it no, I don't. you kind so of, balance. everyone's busy right there. In your and business. Yeah. Okay. So sleeping. So have Mm. you found that, you know, you've have some ways to optimize your own sleep and you're so busy and you're getting up in the morning to the gym. What's, you know, as I work with my clients, creating their sleep hygiene routine, talking about Mm. the ideal day, how to start the day, how to finish the day. What have you found working with yourself and your family and your own clients and your podcast, how to optimize sleep? Any- yeah, so I, I have found that I think, and Huberman talks about this, the early access to light makes a yeah. huge difference. I think exercise in the morning makes a huge difference. I'm somebody who, when I go to bed, I am so tired. I just kind of conk out, which probably isn't good. My latency is quite poor, yeah. but I recently have been tracking my recovery with a device called First Beat, which is really interesting because it's like um, an ECG device uh, equivalent. So it's like a medical grade device that has little like gel on it, like you would have with an ECG and it sits mm-hmm. across the heart and it basically observes you. So you would do like a one day, a three day or a five day uh, um what's the word review if you like right and assessment assessment is the word and what you can see in there is when you're moving for sure but you can toggle on between your hrv and your heart rate all day long and you can also see how sympathetically or parasympathetically Mm -hmm. engaged you are so this has been really insightful for me because sometimes when you're in what they would call the red where there's a high level of sympathetic activity it could be just that you're concentrating right i don't know if i look now maybe this would be sympathetic engagement right so stress is not always bad that means you're actively engaged but then there's times of the day where I'm focusing like doing some research like you I'm really enjoying it preparing my own content and I'll be in the green recovery Mm -hmm. and what I see at night is interesting and having looked at it with clients is that some people are very good at recovery in sleep and others are not and they do need a little bit more work and they wake up and they don't feel great they don't feel refreshed but they're not sure why and what I can see from looking at that data is that the, you can measure recovery in terms of your parasympathetic sympathetic engagement by looking at the duration of the period, but also the intensity 
of those metrics. So if you've got a really high reading on the graph and you're in the green and you're high up, you're getting very intense periods of recovery. And that's something that when we go back to Dr. Benjamin Hardy, he talks about this concept of psychological detachment. That to me is one of the most important things you can do if you want to enhance your recovery. Because if you can't detach from what's been going on during your day, you can't get into those deep states of rest. And so that is about finding an evening routine that allows you to do that. Mm -hmm. And one of the best things is bookending your day, as you know, so writing out your top three priorities for the next day so that you've put them away and you don't Mm -hmm. have to carry that in your head, Mm -hmm. but also spending some time doing something you love. And body work can be great, things like foam rolling, you know, watching something if you enjoy it with a family member. I think put blue blockers on so you're not exposing yourself to much blue light. But if you enjoy that and that's how you spend time together, I would just watch out for too stimulating activity, reading, really good, doing some yoga in the evening. Anything that helps you really relax will help to shift your body into more of that recovery mode. But -hmm. I think if you have a hangover from the day, that's when I see it impacting my client's recovery. Mm -hmm. So like they've had a really difficult client or something, and then they're thinking about it, they're ruminating on it, and they don't get into those deep states. So that's some of it. I think certain supplements I've found, I have my favorites that I don't know about you, uh, Debbie, but that I love and my Mm -hmm. go-tos. Um, yeah. so we can talk about some of those. I don't know what yours are, but yeah. we may, we may cross over. Yeah. Well, I've been kind of going on and off stuff. Cause I'm doing, um, again, my mantra more is not better. Less is more. So I'm trying to cycle in. I was doing a Quicksilver protocol for last in January. Now I'm, I'm doing this. I did my HTMA results and I'm taking this customized supplement. That's a drink mix twice a day. And I love that cause it tastes good and I don't have to take more what supplements. It's by Vicon, a company out of Canada, and it's awesome, amazing, customized based on my HTMA results. So I'm a, I did a podcast on it. It's, I'm a slow oxidizer. I'm a high calcium, I'm calcium oh, shell. Same here. Oh, you are. Same here. I think that's about, I think a lot of that's to do with the emotional stuff we've been through uh-huh. in the last 12 months. Yeah. So yeah. I just found this out. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm, yeah. I, I totally believe everyone needs the HTMA test to go with their GI map and their Dutch test now and their food sensitivities and uh, like a wheat zoomer. But I find it fascinating information, but they make customized drink supplement that you can drink based on your results. So you can make a, a slow oxidizer calcium shell, low thyroid, low adrenals. And that has all the vitamins and minerals I need in it. So supplements at nighttime, I haven't taken as much, but usually like magnesium and I'll kind of rotate them. Um, But what are your favorites you're doing now? So I actually have been taking, I did an interview with Barton Scott, the founder of of Upgraded Formulas. He'll be mad if I, because I've been doing Vicon, not their minerals. (laughs) (laughs) And so I've been taking his, like, uh, his minerals, which are Mm. nano minerals, and they've been really helping, actually. Mm -hmm. I've been taking quite a bit of potassium to kind of break that. Um, But also, I find sleep-wise, magnesium, for sure, it's like still hands down yeah. one of my favorite ever mm-hmm. supplements. Um, and then sometimes I'll take ashwagandha and then okay. I don't like to, you can kind of become a bit acclimatized to it. So I mix it in and out with some, I've got a Viridian L-theanine lemon balm blend, which is mm-hmm. really nice. Um, I like reishi. I kind of rotate on and off these. So I don't take mm-hmm. them all at once. Yeah. I kind of just take one. I'll always take magnesium and then I'll pair it with something. And I'll do a few months where I might take ashwagandha, then a few months where I'm taking the healthy name with a lemon balm. And then sometimes I'll be taking like a combo of reishi and chaga, which I find really relaxing mm-hmm. and obviously supports the moon health at night. Um, so those are kind of the things. Glycine is really good. Mm-hmm. And I think that also is helpful yeah. for balancing out when you're, you know, as an athlete and you're having much higher levels of protein. If you're having a lot of methionine, I think having that glycine can be really mm-hmm. good, particularly if you're not eating collagenous cuts of meat and things. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that's another good one. But I'd say those were what, sort of my top ones, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been cycling in and out. And I, I just did a podcast, my new solo 30 minute podcast on adaptogens. And and then looking at the sleep toolkit by Hooverman Lab, I did a episode on that, but just how his little sleep stack and how to rotate in and out glycine and ashwagandha, they say too, to cycle in and out as well. So I, I think it is good to just not, as they said in an episode, you know, not have to take supplements to have sleep. It's just, I like to see you know, how they can enhance my deep sleep and improve recovery and, you know, so you can wake up feeling refreshed and energized. So it's just... 
so much of it lifestyle habits and not depending on, I would say you can't out supplement poor lifestyle habits. You got to do it all. <laughs> like yeah, you can't out exercise bad diet, but you can't yeah, you know, yeah. out supplement. So I try to rotate things in and out. And we started an evening routine doing our new sunlight and sauna. I used to have it before I moved and I just bought a new one because I sold the old one and then how to do stretching routine. So kind of a, a yoga stretch. Another, I sound like I listen to Huberman all the time, but it was um, Travis Elliott Yoga. They have a an app, they have a lot of free videos on YouTube and they have sleepy time yoga and yin yoga oh, that do at nighttime. But they did this one episode, yoga for runners at nighttime, but it was based on, again, Huberman, who obviously impacting the world with his millions of followers, but research-based how to improve flexibility, holding a stretch for 30 seconds doing it three cycles through. So Travis Elliott yoga that I do, they made a video workout. That's just four stretches on my right, four on the left cycle through it, three circuits. And you do that four times a week. So that's what we've been doing at nighttime, but kind of brush my face, um, brush my teeth, wash my face, do all that, have the bed already. So I just do it Very before cool. bed. I turn on a fireplace, light a candle mm. and then roll into bed and then do my gratitude journal and read mm. my book. But it's just kind of that sleep routine to kind of end your day and, and then start your day. People can write in their gratitude journal. If they do. I'm, I'm more yeah, the type to get up and bed. go and start moving, doing my little stuff in the morning, get going. But uh, yeah, but sleeping, the lifestyle habits that I work on, but I just recorded a podcast on that too, that I said, doing too much at night, as I said earlier, more is not better that I stressed out because I was trying to do you know, like go from sauna to the stretching, to do this, to do that. And it's like, okay, I only have one hour because I go to bed at eight o'clock that now this is stressing me out because I'm trying to do all these lifestyle oh, wow, you go to bed at eight o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> I could not go to bed then. I wish I could. I'm like I'm 9, 30, 10. I know. See, I know. I'm still running around the kids at eight o'clock. Yeah. That's a, the yeah. good and bad thing of not, I don't have children, so I don't have anyone else thrown to bed at eight o'clock, but Neil and I, and then I wake up at four thirty in the morning to go work out and oh, nice. start work at eight yeah, usually. So that hour. yeah. So four thirty <laughs> is my favorite time, but I just don't get enough sleep because I'm kind of like two hours, I think, behind me. When um what are you reading at the moment? You mentioned reading there. Oh, it's funny. I was reading Dr. Mindy's book on fasting like a girl and I started, I finished it. And then I have to, I have such poor memory, which I'm hoping that all this mineral rebalancing will improve my memory because I have to read it again. But then I have um a client that reminded me of Dr. Tom O'Brien's book called The Autoimmune Fix, because I have two clients of celiac, and it just got me down rabbit hole of autoimmune diseases and started pulling out his book last night, which I've already read. But again, I forget everything. It's like, oh, yeah, I remember reading that once I get into it. So that's a lot to take in. Really that. exciting book to read at nighttime. <laughs> <laughs> I find so for me I tend to read spiritual books at night because if I yeah. read work-based books then I, that's when I struggle to sleep and I, yes. I am a big fan actually of doing a brain tap at night I mm -hmm. like doing brain tap just before I go to sleep and then first thing when I wake up now, and tell, if I'm really lucky I'll works. do one in the afternoon but in, a brain tell people about a brain tap is. so brain tap is a device that you can use by invented by Dr. Patrick Porter which uses light and sound mm -hmm. therapy alongside his I guess it's kind of almost to reprogram your mind Mm -hmm. uh, I've just been recording some stuff to go on there myself, actually. It's very, very <gasps> cool and fun. Um, and it just, honestly, I can, he has a free app you can, you can download. And basically it just helps change your mindset really, really yeah. quickly. There's a lot of research, uh, behind it. So that's very cool. Yeah. I enjoy that. That'd be cool. Yeah. I need, there's so many different devices and stuff we learn about to do, but all right. So we have last few minutes here. Big I actually have a future self meditation going on there. So Ooh. you can, yeah, we were talking about future self, weren't we? So. Yeah, let me do that. Um, okay, last question. Big question we talked about the past year, I think. Fasted training or not? I know mm -hmm. you interviewed, I listened to you, yeah. Dr. <laughs> Stacey Sims, and I've I know she told me before. off. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I still haven't stopped doing it though, because so I just it, can't eat at that time in the morning. I know. So, so that's my whole conversation. Mm. I keep sharing my mm. podcast and I go back to Ben Greenfield's information. I've been listening to Dr. Andy Gaplin's. I'm redoing their endurance podcast they did and they're fueling. And if you work out in the morning, if, and this is what I do with clients, like work backwards. What did you eat the dinner before? What time did you stop eating? Do, do I have enough fuel in the tank? in the morning, cause I'm not going to eat something. And if you're doing a harder workout, 
you know, I think she talks about you, women need calories more than men pre-workout if they're doing more of a high intensity workout, this more glycogen depleting, like a hit training, CrossFit, mm-hmm. you know, doing her short intensity intervals that need to be like work your ass off, heart rate up super high, recover. So what have you kind of learned from your own experience and interviews you've done on your show on fuel? I mean, I think the thing is, so I like Stacey's, um, she talks about basically mixing up a double espresso, I think, with a, or a single or a double with um, a bit of unsweetened almond milk, maybe half yeah. a banana yeah. or a little bit of maple sugar and a bit of protein powder, right? So it's very, very small amount of calories, but it's enough for a kick. Personally, yes. I can't do that at the time I work mm. out. And the only time that I'm, if I'm going to get a workout done, it's going to be before the school run. So it's the same as you. It's like 5 a.m. And I don't feel able. I do have some caffeine and sometimes I'll have some essential amino acids. Mm -hmm. The difficulty I've found, and I don't know if any mums are listening to this, but I find it hard to refuel afterwards. So when I get back in the house, it's then time to shower, wash my hair, get the ready kids. And, you know, actually I feel like coffee, not a protein shake or something like that, which I can grab and go. So I, and I'm ravenous. And so it's really, it's a challenge. Um, Mm -hmm. Do I think that my results could be a bit better if I, redesign things probably i notice i can lift heavier uh, mm. for sure when i'm pre-fueled and i think yeah. you know like mid-morning and and you know, in a perfect world i guess i would work out at 11 but it isn't <laughs> yeah and i do find it primes my day i think having said that i'm still making really good progress i did a dexa scan to measure this and look what does my bone density like what does my muscle mass look like what does my fat look like And actually, it was all really, really positive. I think the key thing for people listening, actually, for women in particular, is to refuel with protein and carbs soon Mm -hmm. afterwards. And for both men and women, understanding that you need between 30 and 50 grams of protein with two and a half grams of light leucine to be able to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. So if you're not hitting that threshold, you're definitely not taking advantage of it. And I think while eggs are very bioavailable, you've got to eat quite a few to get what you need. (laughs) (laughs) I know everyone has like two eggs and like it doesn't cut it. Really gonna do it. That's no the thing, is it? So, yeah, you got to do quite a few. And I, I remember really paying attention to this. I do think there's a lot of research around the fact that if you eat within an hour of waking, it can help realign circadian rhythm. Mm-hmm. It can help with adrenal function, as you know. If you go to bed by ten thirty p.m., it can help with adrenal function. And I think that if you can refuel quite quickly, there's a lot of support for that and bringing the fasting window earlier. I think one of the hottest topics is, and I think I might have seen you talk to Dr. Mindy about it, in fact, uh, around when do you have your carbs and how do you sleep better? We were talking about sleep. Mm -hmm. Personally, I am not a fan of not eating carbs and then dumping them all at the end of the day. I don't find that's good. It sends my blood sugar crazy. If I look at something like the Lumen device, I Mm -hmm. wake up in carb burning mode. I Maybe it's women. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's my Mm -hmm. age. Maybe it's perimenopause. It doesn't seem to work for me or or a lot of members of my community. So I tend to stagger my carbs a little bit and I will have a small portion of carbs in the evening. Mm -hmm. Enough to help me sleep. But I also think when we look at melatonin being produced in the evening, if you've if you've already started producing lots of melatonin, your insulin sensitivity goes down. So I think dumping carbs just before bedtime mm-hmm. is probably not a good idea. Yeah. But that tends to be. So I try to keep it a bit earlier and I try to refuel as soon as I can with a decent amount of protein and some carbs. Uh, it is an ongoing challenge. I mean, I, I discuss this on my show all the time of this whole fueling and, and training this with clients to let's figure out how to match your fueling and training together to eat or not eat. And it depends. And I tried to make a chart for my clients recently of this week I was doing it. It's like, all right, let's just make a little graph. What time you're working out? What's the duration? What's the intensity? What did you when did you stop eating the night before? What did you eat in that meal? And it's just so much to go into. How's your HRV today? How's your sleep? How, you know, go into all that and really personalize fueling. Now I don't like eating beforehand, but I, I feel like it's, Oh, I get to eat, not eat, but consume calories to perform better. So I'm kind of thankful. Oh, I can put that uh, layered superfood coffee creamer <laughs> into my coffee and have 10 calories in it and not feel guilty. Oh, I'm breaking my fast. Cause I think we get so, um, not anal, but you know, mm. just perfectionist, like, Oh, I got to just only do black coffee and I have to be fasted workout. Exactly. And again, go back and listen to the Dr. Andy Gaplin interview on endurance exercise for Huberman lab and how it doesn't really matter. <laughs> he said to, you know, eat or not eat, do what it makes you feel good. You know, it's, it's not what type of workout or fueling is just, you know, burning calories and depleting your muscle glycogen stores and tapping into fat stores. 
So it's fascinating to go over his research, but yeah. So listen to Dr. Stacey Sims, but then listen to Dr. Gablin, listen to all these different people. But then it's all that N equals one, what works best for you. Look at your day schedule, your life schedule, and so much goes into it. So um, anyways, I think, you know, having a little something, my coffee with mushrooms and having a little MCT oil in it and having uh, a little bit, maybe the pumpkin spice creamer is from coconut oils is, or coconut sugar is okay for me. It's, it made me improve my performance. So if I'm trying to hit what I've been talking about my show, if I'm trying to hit higher speed workout interval splits on my run workout Tuesdays, if I'm trying to hit power meter on the bike intervals in my class I'm doing that's based on FTP or functional threshold, my watts want to be higher. Should I eat a little, not eat, but consume some calories in a drink to improve performance. So it depends on what is the purpose of the workout. What are you trying to get out of it? You know, it's not about burning fat. It's about getting stronger and faster. So it goes into really specifically, what is that workout? How can you improve the outcome based yeah, on your goals? Yeah, it's great advice. Totally. I agree. <sighs> so, so much to go into, but, uh, Let's kind of share your podcast information, play all the links in the show notes. Sure. I'd love to do that. So Debbie's actually been on my podcast. So it's high performance health. And uh, we talk about very similar topics, I think. Um, through the lens for me, it's all about high performance. I guess I have a little bit more of a, a business um, and, and workplace focus alongside as opposed to athletes. Um, but it's really geared at mostly women and optimizing um, your hormones, your health, your longevity, your metabolism. Uh, but there's there's a few uh, male centric episodes on that as well. <laughs> and then if people want to get a kind of health, free health check and a personalized report from me, they can do that. I have a biohacking quiz. It takes less than 60 seconds and I'll send you a free report with some recommendations. And that is over at your total health check dot com. Nice. You are busy, so, but I'm glad you're making time for yourself and your family yeah. and not overworking and the we- come from being doing what we're doing because we were burned out and broken from our previous life. And so it's just avoiding that cycle because I think a lot of us are all these high performing individuals, type A, triple A, that we get into something we're passionate about. And then we just kind of get ourselves overworking and under recovery. Mm -hmm. So we always have to make sure we balance it all together. For sure. (laughs) (laughs) It's constant work. It's easier said than done, but we love what we do. So thank you. Well, let you go enjoy your weekend and go play with your family. (laughs) Thank you. Thanks so much for having me on the show, Debbie. I've loved it. Thanks for listening to the Low Carb Athlete Podcast. If you have any questions, feedback, or topic suggestions, let us know on Facebook or at DebbiePotts.net. You can help us to continue to grow by leaving a review on iTunes. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.